Ladies and gentlemen, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but today is the eighth day of the year 2012. And guess what? I'm still here. The Mayans were wrong. Thank God for that. But Jesus is right. Because at any moment, the trumpet is going to sound and the dead in Christ will rise. And those who are alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And we'll all get caught up in the air. And there's going to be a meeting in the air. In that sweet, sweet by and by. Right? And I'm going to meet you over there. But I hope to meet you in the meantime here too on a regular basis. Today is the eighth day of 2012, and time has flown by, probably in this last year, you're looking back, maybe at last January, January 1st and on in 2011, and I want to ask you some questions. I want to ask you, what's changed since last year at this time? What was your workplace like last year at this time? Are you in the same workplace? What was your family like? Are they any nicer? Are they any worse? Or are they just the same old dull routine? What was church like a year ago in January? Think back. Have you lost anyone or anything in the last 12 months? Have you gained anyone or anything or any weight in the past 12 months? Or have you lost any? Things have changed, haven't they? A year ago, things were different. Things will change this year as well. Who knows what's going to happen next? Who knows that as we make our New Year's resolutions, I don't know if you're big on New Year's resolutions, but I'm not that big on New Year's resolutions because I hate failure, you know? (laughs) But uh, it's good for us to pause every few moments in our lives on a regular basis and ask these questions. How am I different? What's different about my life? Am I any more close to the Lord now than I was a year ago? Am I more engaged in what the Spirit is doing in my life? Have I learned anything new? Have I been engaged in anything new? Or has my life become just a frazzled or or, or frayed, ended type of garment that is constantly coming apart? Am I growing in Christ? Or is my life stagnant and stable only without any kind of challenge or, or, or extra? We've got to ask these questions on a regular basis. New Year's resolutions are much like the molting process of a lobster that they go through before that they're full adults. I don't know if you know about this, but when I was a, a younger uh, a kid, I went a couple of, well, at least once I remember specifically going lobster fishing with my granddad. And off the shores of the Miramichi River in, in New Brunswick. And uh, we went out that one day, and what a long day that was. They're up at really early in the morning, getting all the traps ready and put out onto the, the boat. And then you go out and you, you, you lay all the traps for one part of the, the day, and you pull out traps for another part of the day. And you bake them and rebake them, and they're coming up and going into the water all the time. And you're pulling up lobster. And at the end of the day, your treat for doing all of this is that you get to eat lobster on the boat. They pick up the big pot, you know, and they bring out the the, the big burner and they they fire up the propane burner and put the seawater in the pot and they throw the lobster in and you hear them going, it's really fun (laughs) to watch lobster scream. And they throw it and they they make their count of the catch and they're like, oh, we've got way too many for the for the, 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 the people at the, the dock who are going to probably fine us for overcatching. So what do you do with the difference? Do you throw it back? No, you eat it on the boat, right? So they'd be throwing all these lobsters in. We have this big feed of lobster. And I remember, boy, could my granddad eat lobster. Wow. The guy was a machine. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that he at the time, I mean, he was probably in his 50s at the time, which seemed really old to me at that time. <laughs> But uh, he could really eat lobster. And uh, I think that one day, I remember he ate probably about seven or eight full lobster in one day. I mean, but you gotta understand, folks, we were out there for 14 hours in the swells. With, I didn't bring a lunch. They said, oh, you'll be fine. You don't have to worry about lunch. And of course, the old lobster fisherman maritime tradition is you crack open the, uh, the lobsters and you crack open a case of Molson Export, right? <laughs> Now, unfortunately, you can't drink seawater when you're on a boat, and the only thing that they offered me was a beer. So, and I gotta tell you folks, I was only, I was a young kid, and I wasn't saved, so I thought, okay, this is the normal life, so I, I, you know, I'm like, I'm dying of thirst, so I started pulling back this beer, and I'm going, this is the worst stuff I've ever had in my life. 
But at that moment, I had to because I was dying. So I'm eating lobster, I'm drinking, I'm confessing to the church that I drank beer, that's okay. Pre-salvation, pre pre-credentials. -pre okay, it's all gonna go to the district in about four minutes as everybody texts. That's the problem with smartphones in the church these days. Everybody texts each other. You can't even be private about your call to a ministry because everybody knows. But uh, so, so we're having this, this feast. And my grandfather starts telling me a little bit about lobster. And one thing that he told me that I found very fascinating is that when lobster are growing up, when they're, when they're developing, they actually crawl out of their shells probably about five times during their development as they get larger and larger. They lay over on their side, the shell cracks open, and they actually crawl out of the shell on the seabed floor. And the shell is left to go with the waves. And then they have to grow a new exoskeleton. They have to grow a new external shell. And about five times during their lives, they are completely vulnerable to the waves and to the predators in the sea. And they're totally vulnerable and exposed. But it's all part of the growth process of the lobster. It's all part of how they develop into a larger body being. And that's really what, what our New Year's resolutions are all about, folks, is that we come to a point in our lives where we have to almost lay down and crack open all the old shell of our, our existence and our past. And we have to almost crawl out of it so that we can be free to grow into a larger capacity in Christ. And that's what this is all about right now, is taking the time to say, God, I'm crawling out of the old shell this morning. I'm going on to something new today. And I'm making myself vulnerable, but I trust that in the process, you will protect me. I will step out in faith, and I will know, in a sense, that we're all like lobsters. Our growth into Christ's likeness requires us to get rid of the old, hard, protective shells and allow God to take us to a new place in Him. Paul wrote about this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17, when he says this. And this is the advice, I think, really going into a new year, going into a new season, going into the vulnerable stage of our lives. These are the things that we ask ourselves and these are the things we assess. And he said this, he said, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. There's a lot of foolish living going on in the world today. And the Bible says that foolishness and fools are defined by their relationship or lack of relationship with God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's what defines foolishness, is when we go outside of the will of God or go outside of the knowledge or the character of God in our lives. We become fools. We're wise when we're in the counsel of God. So he goes on and he says, make the most then of every opportunity in these evil days. So God has given you a lot of opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, that maybe you don't even assess or see right in front of your face sometimes. We think that church will always be there. We think that God will always be there. We think that the way things are will always be there. But what happens if things change dramatically in our lives in a heartbeat? What happens when the diagnosis comes? What happens if the church burned down? What would happen if suddenly the government passed a law that would no longer be appropriate for us to declare the gospel message publicly in Canada. And let me tell you, there is a bill right now in the legislature, in the Supreme Court, whereby we may be very, very restricted on what we can say from our pulpits in terms of what the biblical model is for what we consider holy living. There's a, there's, there's a, a bill right now that we really need to pray about for the, strategically before the Supreme Court. What if that was taken away from us? What would we do next, ladies and gentlemen, if it wasn't the same as it always has been? Because we've had it pretty easy in Canada for a lot of years. And there are people around the world right now who are living for Christ. There was a, a, this, this email message that you sent out, Brother Bowler, about a, a gentleman who is under persecution in, in, a, in one of our, our countries of the world. And he is slated for execution based upon his faith in Christ. We need to pray and continue to pray for people who are going through that. November this past year was the month that we prayed for the persecuted church. And I don't know how many, how many of you folks saw the posters around the building reminding us to do that. But the opportunity in these evil days of what the Spirit is doing today is unprecedented in the history of the church. And what would we do if everything changed? 
Are we still going to be that close to God, or are we going to be annoyed and put out? Because we've always had it this way, and it's always been easy for us to get dressed and drive to church, come in the building, most of us on time, and worship the Lord freely. What would happen if all that changed? So then Paul says, don't act thoughtlessly. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand the will of God for your life. Don't just let it try to absorb into your life. Some people think that God's will is like osmosis, that God will force it upon us if we just go to church. There is decisions that we have to make. There are, there are, there are things that we have to do to be wise and live the Lord's will in our lives. Things that we have to make happen in our own lives. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. Number one, first of all, is living as those who are wise. Living as those who are not foolish. Now, a lot of wisdom is in very strange places these days, and there's a lot of wisdom that comes out of the mouths of young children and babes especially. And listen to the wisdom of some of the children who wrote a few things that they thought were wise things. Patrick, age 10, said, never trust a dog to watch your food, right? Does that make sense? Or Michael, age 14, said, when your dad is mad and asks you, do I look stupid? Don't answer him. <laughs> Michael, wise man that he was, also said, never tell your mom her diet's not working. <laughs> Ever. Not a good idea. Randy, nine years of age, said, stay away from prunes. One wonders how he discovered that bit of wisdom. <laughs> Another age nine-year-old said, never hold a dustbuster and a cat at the same time. <laughs> Naomi, age 15, said, if you want a kitten, start by asking for a horse. You know, and just kind of, it just keeps going down until you get to the kitten, right? Lauren, age nine, said, said felt markers are not good to use as lipstick. Okay, ladies? <laughs> Wisdom, right? Joel, 10 years old, said, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. <laughs> and Eileen, age 8, said, never, ever, ever try to baptize your cat. <laughs> don't play church at home. And if you do, don't try to baptize your cat. Now, all that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? These are things that we all know. But I'm amazed, ladies and gentlemen, as I go through years of ministry, I'm amazed at how much perfect sense Christians miss in the decision-making of their lives. God is a God of sense, isn't he? And the Word of God is absolutely wise in all that we do and all that we are, and God has a wonderful plan for every life if we follow his Word. Yet sometimes we're skeptical of the plans of God and the, and, and the, the principles of his Word. God, is that really true? Should I really do that? That doesn't really make sense to me. I don't fully get why you would want me to be that way. I can't live like Jesus. Why should I try? All of these things are just excuses for us to say, God, we're, we don't really trust you that well. Pure wisdom in our lives makes us what we call followers of Christ. Here's the definition of wisdom. It's the ability to discern or judge what is true, right, or lasting. I googled it. There it is. And so this is what wisdom is. But the problem is, is in our culture today, the battle, the big battle of our culture is what we call truth versus relativism. Wisdom is what we consider to be truth in God. But our culture is not about truth. Our culture is about what is true to them or to me. And that is what we call relativism, where it's relatively everyone's view of what is good for them and not good for me. So you hear it all the time. That's good for you, Pastor. And I appreciate how passionate you are about your religion but that's not what I believe and it's not good for me. That is a sense of relativism in our culture where nobody believes anymore that there is actually an ultimate truth up here that nobody can change and will stand alone no matter what anybody believes on earth. In fact, we've gotten so relativistic in our culture that school and, and university and teaching and, and just culture in general fights against a truth-based religion or a truth-based teaching. 
because it's offensive to somebody somewhere. Well, I want to tell you something, that God's truth actually is so misunderstood in our society today that God's truth takes into account every culture, every situation, every individual, and every personhood to give them a hope and a future. But if the world doesn't see that, then they become what we call relativistic. They begin to believe what is convenient for them personally, and in that personal belief they feel comfortable and are not, not required to ascend to a, an ultimate or a perfect truth, so they're no longer accountable to a God or God. And then they can do what they want. There's no moral code. It's a challenge for us. When everybody thinks that they can do whatever is right in their own eyes, it not only is one of the attributes of the end times, it's also a very precarious situation for people who live truth and ultimate truth. Live like those who are wise. Because I tell you this, folks, and this is my experience. Despite the fact that everybody says about their own belief systems, everybody on the face of the earth, whether they like it or not, is what I call a theologian. They have a sense of who God is. Whether they believe in Him or not, they have a sense of what they believe their God is. Everybody on the face of the earth is a theologian. Everyone has a faith-based life Every time you get on an elevator, you have faith that the people who put the elevator together did their jobs properly. Have you ever thought of that when you got in the elevator? I wonder if the guy who put the big bolt on was sleeping that day. Yay! You know? Or every time you go through a green light, you have faith, hopefully, that everyone else is obeying the rules of the road going the opposite way. Everybody lives by faith. But they just don't understand, and what we don't understand in our culture is that the ultimate expression of faith is to have faith in a God who has promised that he would be there for us no matter what. That is the ultimate truth. And I don't want relativism then because relativism is like waves of a pond that go left, right, and center. And I don't know where they're going to end up. But truth is concrete, and I can stand on it, and I can walk on it, and I can live on it, and I can build my house on it. That's what we're missing in our, in our society. And the enemy's done a great job of bringing a relativistic culture into Canada. And folks, those who are wise live by the truth. And the truth of God's word. Relativism is the concept that points of view have no absolute truth or validity, having only relative subjective value according to differences in perception, and consideration. Basically, each person makes their own rules. Ultimately, this will not last forever. Jesus has to come soon, amen? Because this will continue to fracture in our society, and they'll come to the place where nobody will know what, what is true and what is right anymore for any reason, except those who understand ultimate truth. So, there is no absolute truth in relativism, but there sure is in the Word of God. So, John 14, 6. Here's a reference for you. Jesus said, here's how you find truth. You find him. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Understanding who God is results in good judgment. Understanding the concepts of the Word of God bring together firm foundation judgment that will not only last on earth, the test of time, but it will last the test of time for eternity as well. Again, these are not things that you haven't heard before. Amen? Mm -hmm. Say, I've heard this before, Pastor. Go ahead. You can say it. You're going to hear it again. It's going down to Alabama again for a minute. Because it's important that we continue to reset our foundation. This is what we stand for. This is what we stand on, folks. Here's number two. This is what Paul said in verse 16. He says, make the most of every opportunity during these days which are evil. And I don't have to preach too long about the evil days, but let's just remember that, that we have to seek these opportunities in God. And it reminds me of a story about a man who went to the doctor to, uh, to find out why he'd been having such severe headaches. And the doctor ran some tests, and after a few hours, he called the man into his office, and he says, I, I have horrible, terrible news for you, he told the patient. 
He says your condition is terminal. Oh no, the man cried, how long do I have? And the doctor, he says, well, he said 10. And then he says, well, well 10 what? 10 what, doctor? 10 years, 10, 10 weeks, 10 hours? And the doctor says 10, 9, 8, 7. You never know, folks, what's going to happen next to you. You never know. All I know is this, is that God has called us to make the most out of every opportunity during these evil days. Because we don't know how much longer we have before the trumpet sounds. The psalmist, Psalm 39 verse 4 wrote, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Remind me that my life is like a wisp, like it's just like a vapor that evaporates before my eyes. How many of you think that the years have gone pretty quickly so far? Way too fast. It's time for us to make the opportunities that God gives us real and, and viable and true. And, and you know, we've been dreaming, folks. I tell you, we've been dreaming. I've heard it since I've been here in the last four months. We've been dreaming about all these big things that God wants to do in Trinity Church. And I hear, I hear, I hear talk, I hear talk, 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 talk. It's time to say yes. God, you can do it. And yes, God, you're gonna. And I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna see it. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna seek your face. Like we heard in the song this morning. And you know, we've gotten away from seeking the face of God. When our hearts say, I will seek your face, oh God. I will seek your face. I will get back to the day where I realize that the only way to know who God is is to seek his face. And I will see and see his face. Look what it says in Psalm 90 verse 10. It says the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we, if we have the strength. And 90 if you're really cool. And 100 if you're an amazing person. And 110 if you want to make the record books. And 120, I don't know anybody who's 120. But... God has given us 70 years-ish, or 80 if we have the strength. They quickly pass and we fly away. We should be expecting God to give us opportunities in that time. We shouldn't be riding this cart of complacency when we only have that amount of time to make a difference on the face of the earth. 70 years seems like a lot of time. 80 years is really a good lot of time. That's the grace of God. Your years will be many upon the earth if you honor your parents and there's other promises there. But on, on, on the life that God has given us, we, we, we've got to look back and we've got to look forward and ask the questions. Are we presenting ourselves? Are we offering the gifts? Are we doing what you've called us to do? And that's one of the reasons why I want to go into a series on the core values of the church because I believe it's important for us to ask the questions, who do we want to be? What opportunities do we want to, to assess and what do we want to grab onto for our lives? Here are some of the, the things that I believe we should want to be as a church. Let me give you a few of them. These are some of the things that are coming over the next weeks, foreshadowing, just to give you a heads up. For instance, core value one, number one is we, we, we should be becoming more like Jesus. <laughs> We should be discipleship living. We should be making effort to become more like Christ in our lives from, a, from a, a, a perspective of a yearly, a weekly, a monthly, a daily basis. Here's a number two, that we should be practicing worship not as a service time as we sing, but we should be practicing worship as a lifestyle. As a lifestyle. We should be worshiping God, not singing all day long, ladies and gentlemen, but we understand that worship is not a time in the service. Worship is a lifestyle. It's an open life that we live before God at all times. It's not the choruses that we sing, whether we sing psalms, hymns, or spirituals. Hear my heart on this. It's not whether it's too loud or too quiet, or whether we sing the songs that we like during church time. Worship as a lifestyle is a, an intimacy with Christ Amen. that matters everywhere we go, not just during church. It matters when we're driving in the car, it matters when we're at home, it matters when we're at the workplace. Worship as a lifestyle doesn't mean you break out in a, in a, a song during the budget meeting at work. 
you know, I could just see you guys at the board table or at the at the table, the lunch table at the factory, right? All of a sudden, blessed assurance, this is my lunch. You know, I just, that's not what I'm talking about because God wants us to be strategically amazing, but not weird. Right? And all the people in the lunchroom go, that's weird. And we're going, I'm just being bold. No, no, you're being weird. When we're, let me tell you something, you affect the workplace. When you're in communion with God, the Holy Spirit affects your workplace. And you find favor with people in your workplace because of your intimacy with God and not because you're bold and throw the word in people's faces. The word of God never returns void. I understand that. There's always value when we bring the word of God to bear. I get that. But the Bible says to speak the truth in love. Mm -hmm. And if there's no love and no relationship and no foundational bridge that's been built, the truth will become relative as opposed to foundational. You see that? So there's always this sense that we have to be close to God. And worship, worship itself is a lifestyle. It's not a, a mode of service or a style of the church. Got to get away from that. That's got to go out the door right away. Like that's retraining that we've got to do from the foundation up. Number three, we're all missionaries. <laughs> get mission starts the moment that we leave the doors of the church. How many of you have been to a church that has the sign that says you are now entering the mission field when you leave the church? Or you're, you drive out of the parking lot. Maybe we need a sign that reminds us that we're now entering the mission field. Missions is not only overseas, ladies and gentlemen. Missions is in the building. Missions is, is beside us in all the homes that live around this church building and all the homes that live around your home. That's where missions is. It's the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and outermost parts of the earth. And God has called us to all of those areas. So, mission starts when we leave the building. Here's number four. We believe that preaching and teaching God's word is central to discipleship. That people need the word of God hidden in their hearts so they may not sin against him. That we need to develop in our, our understanding of God's word, which means that we need to go to Bible study. And we need to go to Sunday night. And we need to go to seminars. And we need to pray through the word. And we need to just say, oh, Sunday morning's not enough manna. I need more bread. I don't want just one. I want to set, reset my foundation to be hungry for God's word because I, I understand that discipleship is beyond just believing. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Number five is we're committed to an unchanging message. Absolutely. But we've got to be creative in our method, in our culture today, so people get the message in their language. And that's exactly why Jesus spoke in parables. That's why Jesus went from town to town. And that's why he... He fellowshiped with all kinds of different cultures because he knew that he had to bridge the gap between those cultures. And he used illustrations and he used analogies and he used things that were beyond our comprehension sometimes to reach into those people's lives. So should we. Number six is we need to have a kingdom vision for ministry. That it's the kingdom that matters, not Trinity Church only, and not only the preference of the individual believer, but it's the body that matters. It's the bigger picture that's the key to the ministry of the church. Amen. That it's about all of us, not just one of us. And it's not even about me just because I'm in leadership and my preferences, because sometimes I preach things that I go, God, are you sure? And sometimes we sing things and we go, God, are you sure? And sometimes we do things and we say, God, are you sure? But he is. And we do it because it's for the body and not just for us as individuals to make us comfortable or happy. But we do it for the kingdom. We have to have a kingdom vision for ministry. Here's another one that's important. We exercise good stewardship of our resources. Amen? <laughs> that we give unto the Lord what's the Lord's, and we give to Caesar what's Caesar's, and we do those things with joyful giving. And we do it right, and in the right ways, and the right timing. In not only the church life, but in each of our lives. And we'll talk about that. We practice prayer as our power source. That we want to be this way. Amen? We want prayer to be the, 
what, what fuels the engine of our lives. These are some of the core values that every church should have. Here's number nine. We practice extra mile service with excellence. We, we, we serve others. And, and I'll tell you the analogies. I, I talk about these messages. I've got lots of different analogies and biblical models that will show that these are things that God wants us to be like because he was like this. And number 10, we are learning and offering our gifts and talents for the work of the Holy Spirit. That we're offering the talents that God has given us to honor his name. Amen? That's why Wednesday night we're unwrapping our spiritual gifts on Wednesday evening study so that we can know what is the gift cluster that God has given to us and how can I offer it to him for his honor and for his glory. Those are just thoughts, folks. Those are not in stone yet. I'm working and praying through as we travel. But those are key things that every church, healthy churches need and healthy bodies need. Which brings me to the last point, and that is that we need to understand the Lord's will. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship or your spiritual worship. Again, living a lifestyle of worship. But the key verse that I want to show you is verse 2. It says this, don't be conformed to the world, this relativism. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, now this is good, that by testing, you may be able to understand or discern in your life. You'll get this by the testing of your life. What is the will of God? The good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I've always asked myself the question, and I've read a lot of commentaries on this, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect. What does that mean? And I've, I've come to a conclusion in my own life that the good is really about the will of God for my life personally. And God has a will for me. David Kingston has God's will. God has written in his book, The Will for My Life. I want to follow that. But I, I understand that God also wants to do it in the church. The acceptable will of God is for what the body engages in. And I'm a part of that, just like you are. So not only is the good will in your life that God has for you and the grace to be offered so that the entire corporate body will, will live the acceptable will of God, which is because we're not perfect, because we're not completely perfect yet, we're not completely like Jesus, it's an acceptable will before God. He accepts it as the body. And he says, I can use this. I can work with you guys because you're willing in the goodness of your own heart to offer yourselves as living sacrifices. And through the testing, you're discerning that you need to offer and live by faith. And the acceptable will of God is that he wants all of us to be as a corporate body living for him. And that's what we deal with in leadership. And that's what we pray through in leadership. Where are we going on the acceptable will of God for Trinity Church? And how do we fit into the big picture? And then we get to the perfect will of God, which is the biggest picture. That God has a perfect plan to use all these churches and all of these individuals together in one great conglomeration of his plan. And only he knows the plan well enough to be able to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. So in my life, the puzzle is that I need to know what God wants for me in discipleship. The puzzle for the church is that God wants all of us to examine that question and bring it all together. But the biggest thing that we'll never know, but we trust and we worship him for, is the perfect plan. We don't always know the end from the beginning, but he does. And that's why we worship him. That's why we know that God's will is perfect. His perfect will. So I want to find out the good will. I want to find out what the acceptable will is. Because I want to sense at least a picture, a portion of the picture of the perfect will. You fit into the church puzzle. The church fits into the kingdom puzzle. And God knows the picture. He knows the big picture. And the vision for all of this is that we would, in every believer in our lives, every one of us would be concerned with how to get there. How do I get to the, the goodwill? How do I get to the pleasing and perfect? How do I get to the acceptable? Every believer in ministry would be balanced and developing in five important areas. This is the vision. The core values are who we want to be. The vision is how do we get there? And these are the areas that we need to develop in as individuals. In prayer, ladies and gentlemen, in 2012, you need to write down, I need to grow in prayer. 
You need to grow in worship. I need to grow in a worship lifestyle. We need to grow in instruction and understanding of the Word of God. We need to grow this year in that. We need to be developed in discipleship. We need to grow in fellowship and understanding who we are as believers. And getting together and understanding, just getting to know people's names is a good start, don't you think? I've heard people here say to me, I know so-and-so sits across the pew and they've been there for about 30 years and I don't even know their last name. Ah, the big one come. We don't even know the last name after 30 years. It's maybe time to cross the foyer and go, by the way, I'm a little embarrassed. That's okay. But I don't know your last name. We need a pictorial directory to make it safe for everybody, don't we? So you can look in and go, oh, that's so-and-so. And then go, go, hi, so-and-so. And they'll go, oh, you know me, do you? Yeah, I checked the pictorial directory. You know, because I'm smart. I'm wise. It might be actually easier just to go over and shake their hand and say, what's your last name? And where do you work? And where are you from? And, uh, you know, don't ask people, are you new to the church? That's not a good question. Ask them, how long have you been coming? Then you won't be as embarrassed. Trust me, because I've just been through four months of this. <laughs> Where people have said, you forgot my name, haven't you? I was like, yeah. I knew it at one point, but you're like, I know, I know one thing. I know one thing. If I, if I approach a lady and her name is Mary, I'm safe. Because I know there's about 100,000 Marys here. It was a really good generation for Mary, for the name Mary. And uh, I know there's a few of you other ladies too. I know Heather, so <laughs> that's what matters. But it takes time, right, folks? It takes time. 30 years is a little long. Four months, I'm, I'm getting there. But fellowship means that we actually take time. Don't we? We pause. It's, it's important to maybe set a goal that today I'm going to find somebody and learn who they are. Do that for, for 20 weeks and you will know a whole section of the church. It's important. And the last thing is evangelism. Evangelism, outreach, missions, something that has been sort of on the back burner a little bit here, is coming right into our faces this year. In fact, I've got a dream. How we get the division is that at least this year we're going to send out at least one team to the mission field. The Lord is going to open the door and He's going to set the, 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 the pace and the zone. And I have to be honest with you, the places that I send missions teams are usually places that I already know what the what the the the, uh, the details are, and I know the relationship with the missionaries, and I know who they are, and how they live, and what they do, and how they do it, and all of those things are important to me as a pastor. That those relationships are intact, so we're not going out and and missing the mark on sending out groups of people. And I do have quite a few relationships where there's a lot of needs out there, where some of you folks who have some incredible gifts that I've already seen could be offered for a short period of time just to bless missions. And I, I, I presented this to the youth group in, in December. Pastor Jordan was on holidays and I spoke to the youth on a Thursday night and shared a little bit of a journey that my wife and I took with a group of young people to the mission field in 1992 to Russia. And now many of the young people in that group are now in full-time ministry. And uh, just because God changed hearts. It's great to give to missions. It's great to be emphasizing missions. But I don't want to just be an emphasis, missions emphasis church. I want to be a missions heart of church. And the only way you do that is to actually go and look with your own eyes. Right? Right, Brother Bowling, Sister Bowling? That's the only way. Is to actually go and land on the premises. I believe that God wants to do that in some of our lives in the next 12 months. I don't care about the money stuff, because God will provide. The budget is irrelevant. What does God want us to do? How does God want us to do it? So, if you notice here, prayer, worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism, take prayer off the top, because that's the, that's the top priority. And you've got the wife model, the W-I-F-E, because we're the bride of Christ. That's how we need to develop in the next year. We need to become the bride of Christ. The prayerful wife. Prayerful bride. Guys, don't be offended by this, just because it's a female analogy. Because the women put up with a lot of stuff that's male in the Bible. Okay? So just relax, because we're the bride of Christ. And I'm pleased and happy to be even in courtship with Jesus, one way or another. Because he's, he's accepted us. So the big question of the year as we go to communion 
as God speaks to us and gives us these opportunities and we live these days, are we listening? Are we listening? Are we listening? Heather, why don't you come? How many of you folks remember way back in the days when there was telegraph? Yeah? yeah? And that was a big mode of communication. <laughs> wow, you're old. <laughs> I didn't realize how old this congregation was, but yeah, like five or six hands went up. I'm like, wow. That was the, that was the fastest method of long distance communication before cell phones. And the, there was a young man who applied for a job as a Morse code operator. And entering the ad in the newspaper, he went to the office that the address that was listed, and he arrived. And, he went into a large, busy office filled with a lot of people who were all trying to get a job. So they're all waiting in the office, and while they're waiting, suddenly there's this background music going on or whatever. And in the middle of that, there's this little sound. Like this, right? So all these people are waiting in the office, and this one guy walks in and he's late, and he's the last one in line. He's got his resume, he's all excited, maybe I can get this job. And then he's got to compete now with like 25 people waiting in line. And they're waiting for the interviews to start. And suddenly, this young man, the last guy in the room, steps up, goes walking in the door, opens the door of the interviewer, walks right in. And everybody else in the outside room is going, huh? They're all ticked off. What's this guy doing? What's he doing? And then a few minutes later, the guy walks out and he's like, He's kind of, you know, doing this, and he's got a piece of paper and this stuff to fill out, and out the door he goes, he's like, yay, and everybody's, so the interviewer walks up, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, the interviews are over for the day. And everybody in the, in the office is like, what are you talking about? That guy was last in line. I was first. I've been waiting for hours. Why didn't you interview me? He said, well, actually, I did. While you were sitting here in the office, I was out in my office sending Morse code saying, if anyone understands this message... Please come immediately into the office because the job is yours. Right? So this guy, <laughs> and everybody's like, ah! and I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. At how many Christians are sitting in the office? God is downloading his message all the time. And they come and go to church and they're faithful. But they never get the job. Because they're not listening. They're not listening. And you know it's amazing that when God has us listen, we go right to the front of the line. Amen. Right to the front of the blessing right to the front of the provision, right to the front of all the, the good things that God can do in our lives. They just, the doors swing open. When we listen, we respond. So God is downloading the message even today. <laughs> Amen. About what he wants to do in 2012. And he's already spoken to some of your hearts even this morning. About what he wants to do in your life. The good will. <laughs> Now let's see what the acceptable will is. And then I know the perfect will is always intact. The ultimate truth.